Well, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, has to be one of the strangest verses in all of the scriptures. Just look at what it says. You just heard it in the bumper. In verse 1, it says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe this just shows my level of immaturity. But when I read that voice, I can't help but read that voice and then hear in my head a sitcom narrator voice saying, yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here (laughs) because here's Jonah in the belly of a fish. And if that's the first verse that you've read in all the Bible, just open your Bible, point your finger. There it is. That's weird, right? That's strange. Uh, Because you got to understand what we walk through in chapter 1 to really make sense of what is going on in chapter 2. So let's start by recapping a little bit about what we talked about in the first week of this series, Jonah, Unexpected Grace. Uh, So we saw last week that this book, Jonah, is a book all about how God pursues rebels. It is about God pursuing rebels. But... When God pursues rebels, he pursues them out of love, not out of the anger that we tend to assume is the motivation behind that pursuit. In fact, Jonah is a book really of unexpected grace to unexpected people. And we're going to see that idea of unexpected grace very clearly as we press into this week. And so the story started last week with the word of the Lord coming to Jonah, a prophet, telling Jonah to get up, go to the city of Nineveh, which was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, go to Nineveh and preach against it because their wickedness had come up before the Lord. Now, instead of obeying, what we see Jonah do is run as far away from God as he possibly could. Like literally, he goes on a ship to Tarshish, which is in the known world about as far away from Nineveh as he could get. He makes his way to the port, he finds a boat, he buys a ticket, he hops on board, the ship sets sail, and probably to his surprise, at that point in the story, everything is going pretty smoothly. And then he goes to the bottom of the boat and falls asleep. Well, what Jonah's probably thinking, maybe, we don't know this for sure, is that, well, maybe this wasn't that big a deal. Maybe God has forgotten. Maybe me preaching against Nineveh didn't really matter that much. Maybe God has just forgotten. But God didn't forget. God loves Jonah too much to let him run away. God pursues rebels. And that's where we read in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea. And such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. So God pursuing Jonah, not out of anger, but out of love, hurls a fastball of a hurricane right at this boat full of sailors and the runaway prophet. Now, when Jonah is woken up, he immediately knows full well who is responsible for what's happening in that ship. He knows that this is his fault. And not wanting the sailors on board to die on his behalf, Jonah acknowledges his guilt and disobedience before the Lord and tells the sailor that they should throw him over and when they do, the storm will go away. But the sailors, not wanting to take the life of what they see as an innocent man, they say, through one last valiant effort, let's make it to shore. So they row and they row and they just can't get there. Ultimately, they relent, they ask God for forgiveness, and they toss Jonah into the raging storm. And then we read in chapter 1, verse 17, that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. So when you think about the story of Jonah, this is what you think about, right? The runaway prophet, the storm that threatens to sink the ship, and then when Jonah is tossed overboard, you have to think about the whale, or or very literally the fish, that comes and swallows him whole. But I think that here, in these two instances, the storm and the fish together, we see one of the biggest misinterpretations or maybe at best, best misunderstandings in all of the scriptures. You see, I think when we hear this story as kids growing up in Awana's Vacation Bible School, Bedtime Bible Stories, when we hear this story, we tend to hear the storm and the fish as tools of God's anger and His wrath. We see those things as God's punishment against Jonah because of his disobedience and running away. 
But see, that's wrong. That's not, what go, that's not what's going on here. The storm and the fish, see, they're not tools of God's wrath. They're tools of His grace. So let's take just a minute and, and look at these with some fresh eyes. And, and I think that we'll see this. Um, well, let's start with the storm, for instance. Our first clue to what's really going on, this is grace, not wrath, I think we find in the description of Jonah asleep on the boat. If you still have your Bibles open, uh, look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 5, that second part of verse 5. It says that Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and had fallen into a deep sleep. So what we see is that once on board, Jonah descends, that's key, descends to the lowest part of the ship and he goes into what is, quote, a deep sleep. This isn't just a normal sleep. This is a deep sleep. Uh, maybe the closest that we see to these uh, are in the garden when Adam is put to sleep and, and Eve is made out of his rib. It's a different kind of sleep. And I think the picture here, when you put those two pieces together, is we see Jonah dead in the grave of his disobedience, his sin. He descends to the, into the bowels of the ship and goes into a deep sleep. I think that's a picture that Jonah is so far from God, fleeing from his presence, that Jonah is dead in his disobedience. Just think of Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Right? So if this is indeed what's going on, this is a picture of Jonah being dead, desensitized in his sin disobedience, then I believe, and I believe that's what is, is happening, then the storm that wakes Jonah up, that very symbolically brings him back to life, is not a work of wrath, it's a work of grace. If we were to keep reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love He had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. So I think when we understand what, what's going on here it is that if this is a picture, and I think it is, of Jonah dead in his sin and trespasses, totally asleep, fleeing from God's presence, then it is grace that wakes him up. It is grace that makes him alive, even if that grace comes in the form of a storm. The other clue, I think, that God is showing Jonah grace, not judgment, is actually very clear when we use just a, a little bit of common sense to think through the situation. Here in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is running from God. Not just God's will, but God's presence. It says that very clearly in verse 3, that Jonah is running from the presence of the Lord. And if God were, were here to let Jonah keep running, even if he was running in peace and comfort, that would be his judgment. Letting Jonah run away, letting Jonah get far from him, that would be the judgment of God. You see, it is the grace of God, not the judgment of God, that brings us back to God. And so whatever it is, even if it's a storm, if it brings us back to God, closer to Him, then that's His grace and not His wrath. Anything that awakens us from our sin and rebellion and brings us back to the presence of God is the grace of God. And then I think when we understand that, seeing grace in the whale is even easier to see it than, than grace in the storm. Because as Jonah is thrown overboard to save the life of the sailors, the whale comes and swallows him up. Now, now I don't think that was necessarily pleasant, but if the whale hadn't come, Jonah would have drowned. Okay, So the whale is actually God saving Jonah's life. It might not have been fun, but it was effective. Okay? And see, I think the problem for Jonah, and honestly for us, is that oftentimes God's grace can feel like judgment. His love can feel like anger. In the moment when the waves are crashing and the wind is howling and you feel like you're about to sink, it can be really hard to feel grace. But see, the thing is, we can't discern God's grace by focusing on the what is happening around us. 
We only discern God's grace as we understand the why behind that what. You know, at the end of the day, anything that God uses in our life, no matter how painful it is, anything that God uses in our life to bring us closer to Him and further from sin, that's a good thing. Even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it hurts, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it ruins our plans, anything that takes us further from sin and closer to Jesus is the grace of God. And the only way that we will ever truly get that is if we begin to see our relationship with Jesus as the most important part of our life. You know, for most of us, I, I just don't think that's the case. For most of us, we would prefer nice things. We would prefer comfort. We would prefer ease in life more than we do walking in intimacy with Jesus. And because we prefer those things over intimacy with Jesus, the things that push us toward Jesus but take us away from those, it feels like judgment, but it's not. We have to reorient ourselves to truly making our relationship with Jesus the most important thing in our life. And maybe, just maybe, you need to stop right now and wrestle through that in your own life. If it takes you away from comfort, ease, and prosperity, but pushes you closer to Jesus, why does it feel like punishment? Is it because it's those things you value, not intimacy with the Father? You see, I think Jonah did reevaluate those things in his own life. And when he did, we see very clearly that Jonah understood the storm and the fish were both acts of grace from a Lord that was pursuing him in love. We know this very clearly because of how Jonah responds to what's happening to him in chapter 2. Matter of fact, most of chapter 2 is the internal dialogue that Jonah is having with God as he's sinking and as he's swallowed by the whale. Let's just read chapter 2 together. It says this, Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from the belly of the fish. This is Jonah's words. I called to the Lord in my distress and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol and you heard my voice. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the sea, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. But I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundation of the mountains. The earth gates shut behind me forever. But then you raised my life from the pit. Lord My God, as my life was fading away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. And those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So when you hear Jonah's words, it's very obvious, I think, that He understands that this is the hand of God in his life, and yet he sees it as God's hand in his life for his good. That God is doing this for Jonah's good. And so because of that, I think there's there's two parts of this response that I want to draw our attention to as we wind down this week. The first is, is that Jonah offers thanks to God. He offers thanks as worship to God for this unexpected and frankly uncomfortable grace. I mean, that's how he begins, right? I called to the Lord in my distress and you answered me. He, he thanks the Lord for saving his life. Now, honestly, this is hard. Sometimes thanking God for those things in life that hurt, I mean, it really feels impossible. How can we thank God for storms and whales? If you've walked through those moments, even looking back and seeing the hand of God in them working for your good and His glory, they're hard to thank God for in that moment. How do we do that? Well, I think the only way that we can thank God for those painful moments of grace, for those storms and the whales, 
is when we truly know and believe that God is in this moment, in my difficult circumstances, working all things together for our good and His glory. He sees us, He hears us, He rescues us. And it's a good thing too, because you and I get so consumed by what's happening to us right now in this moment that we lose the perspective of the greater good that God is working in our life. And so sometimes for God to pull us out of the mess that we have made of our own lives, it is painful, but that is not judgment. That is grace. And then the second thing is that at the end of this prayer, Jonah recommits himself. Jonah says, you know what? I'm going to fulfill my vow. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to Nineveh. And so we read in verse 10 that the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah out on to the dry land. Spit him up out on the dry land and Jonah begins a long walk to the city of Nineveh. I think that as we recommit ourselves, we have to get to the place where we realize that no matter where God is leading us, following him is always the best option. No matter if it seems hard, difficult, if it seems uh, to mess up the plans that we had already made for our life, following him is the best option. And the truth is that he's always waiting for us to pick up again right where we left him before. And I think that's the uplifting part here of Jonah chapter 2. That God, in the grace of the storm and the grace of a whale, brings Jonah right back to where he started, hearing the word of the Lord and obeying. And maybe today you have been going through some rough circumstances in your life. And maybe today you need to step back and reevaluate. Maybe that's God's hand working for your good, not against you. Maybe this is grace, not wrath. You need to see that God is trying to wake you up and bring you back to Him, even if it means pulling you away from some comfort and ease in your life. And maybe today you know that God has called you to something in your life, something that you ignored, and just because a storm didn't come doesn't mean that God forgot. And the reason that you still feel that distance and coldness and staleness in your walk with Jesus is because you left Him back waiting where He called you the first time, and you need to go back to that place and recommit yourself to follow Him. But I want you to know that wherever you're at and whatever you're walking through, you don't have to do it alone. Even though you're watching this online, right now, if you're watching this live, we have people who are ready and willing to pray with you to help you sort through these difficult things to understand. So reach out, drop a comment, send us a message. If you're on the online platform, click the live prayer button. But we have people who want to come alongside you as you seek to discern God's hand and grace in your life. But for right now, as we end today, let me pray for you. God, thank you for the time that you've given us to look into your word at the unexpected grace that you have shown to Jonah. God, I know often in our life we face storms and we face whales and it doesn't feel like grace. But God, I pray that you would help us to move beyond what it feels like and that we would trust that you are working all things together for our good and your glory. God, that you would help us to see grace in unexpected places And that when you work to draw us to yourself, that we would freely come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.